Good evening, class. Today we're going to talk about a paper. We're going to examine yet another paper. This one is going to is by uh, Helen and Leb Leberman, and it's on Neanderthal speech, which is a quite interesting topic that we're going to be talking about. We're going to be using this topic to further examine how social interaction and group uh, groups work together using different methods of communication. We're also going to be looking at how we can adapt to a challenge, a couple of challenges where we don't have the ability to speak. Um, we're doing this as a flipped lesson mostly because tomorrow's uh, discussions and activities are going to take up most of our two periods of class and I'd like to get this all done in one single grouping. So we're going to start off with a brief introduction about the paper, and we're going to talk about the anatomy and speech, uh, anatomy and how it affects speech. So we're going to start with this um, introduction, and we're going to talk about what is language. So language is the most important factor that separates man from beast. Uh, well, if you think about it, Animals can walk around, they can run, they can collect in groups, they can breed, they can reproduce. They can do pretty much everything that we can, and except for communicate among great distances like we can. So language is considered an abstract of logic, and it is an abstract of logic extends the computational skills and reasoning. So, and this is done by combining minds, and we do this by speaking and sharing our thoughts and ideas and furthering our own uh, understanding of topics. So, the next thing I'd like to mention is this La Chapelle aux Saints fossil, discovered in La Chapelle aux Saints in France in 1908 by Amadie and Jean Boisson and L. Barden. It was the first relatively complete complete skeleton of a Neanderthal. It's considered the classic example, um, which we'll learn a little bit more about later, but it's the specific skeleton is about 60,000 years old, um, and it shares remarkable similarities to newborn humans despite the fact that the skeleton is actually of an adult male, probably closer to a senior level of age. Um, he probably would have been well past his prime at the time of his death. Um, so next I'd like to talk to you about uh, how they analyzed this pa uh, the analysis done in this paper. So they use the fact that newborn humans are incapable of speech. The evolutionary status of Neanderthal was examined in comparison. Alright, so next I'd like to talk to you about some important terminology that's going to be mentioned throughout this examination of this paper. So, Neanderthal is going to be referring to the classic Neanderthal man of the worm. So, the worm is the last glacial period. Um, man, in this terms, is going to refer to modern man, so that's people just like us. The superlaryngeal vocal apparatus, or tract, the SAT, is the portion of the vocal tract above the larynx. Uh, and the words linguistic ability are used to... to t uh, explain the ability or the use of articulate speech. So next we're just going to talk a little bit about the anatomical basis of speech. Speech is a product of the source. The larynx produces the vowels, so that's A, E, I, O, and U. I should hope you know that. If you don't, we should probably have a long talk. Um, <clears throat> and then we're also going so that the, because the larynx produces the vowels, the SVT acts as a filter, and it creates further variation in the frequencies. So the larynx determines what the fundamental frequency of a letter is in the base. So that's the very base frequency. So when you strip out all the changes that the SVT can make, that's going to be what the base frequency is, and that's. Go, the base fundamental frequencies are going to be the vowels. So the SVT 
is going to determine the formant frequencies. And the formant frequencies are the resonant modes of the SVT, and they're determined by the area function. So this might seem a little bit tricky, but A and I, in this case, have different formant frequencies, but they could have the same fundamental frequency. So the letters A and I, when you say them, you change the way you move your mouth. And that's going to change the way it sounds. So that's changing the formants, the formation of the letter. Um, B and D are specifically characterized in the terms of formant frequency. Only the shape of your mouth changes when you say the letters B and D. Um, the consonants are um, caused by transitions or rapid changes in the formant frequency. So the source for the consonants might be air, air turbulence. So if you say the letter P, you can feel the way the air changes as it flows from your mouth. Alright, so next I'm just going to talk briefly about the acoustical theory of speech. So this is how they determined what the um, what they were going to use to analyze the specimens that they had and how capable they would be of producing speech. So the acoustic signal to this uh, superlangeal area function and source are very important and it's going to be used to calculate the possible range of sounds known if the range of the SVT is known. So the phonetic repertoire expands from different sources, um, but using this they can isolate the constraints and it was the basis of this study. So now we're going to talk a little bit about the skeletal structure, uh, the similarities, and the specimens that they used. We're just going to gloss over the specimens here. Um, they used newborns, adult man, Neanderthals, and non-human primates. They used six uh, skulls, heads, and necks from newborns. They were divided mid on the mid-sagittal plane. Um, they were also dissected uh, by the co-author Edmund S. Krellen. Um, that's just a bit of a fun fact that he worked specifically with the newborn skeletons. Um, the specimens of adult mans, they had 50 skulls, 6 heads and necks, and they were also divided on the mid-sagittal plane. Uh, these were important in providing what a good range for the modern man's um, SVT and further on as we talk we'll learn a little bit more about that. And then the Neanderthal, they used two casts of uh, skulls with the mandibles and they also used the mandible of the fossil from the La Chapelle Los Saints fossil. Um, <clears throat> and they also used some non-human primates just to get a good idea of what something that we know is incapable of speech has for its SVT and larynx. Uh, they used a chimpanzee and an adult female gorilla as their specimens here. So similarities, uh, just looking at the skulls, there's very few similarities, although further, um, further examination shows that both the Neanderthal and newborns have fairly similar skulls. So from the front view, you can see that Besides the size disparity, that there's not very many similarities. I mean, they all have two eyes, a nose, and a mouth. But the shape of the skulls is quite different between the Neanderthal and the human and the Neanderthal and the baby. And even, even more surprisingly, the difference between the baby and the adult human. Um, so when you take all three skulls and put them sideways, and you blow the newborn skull up to the same size as that of the adult man and the Neanderthal, you can actually see that there's much more similarities. Um, in this picture, you can see that, one, all the skulls are the same size, but two, that also the Neanderthal and the baby skulls have a very similar positioning and shape. You can see they have this, what's considered a ponged shape, and ponged, which this is a term you should know, is that of a non-human primate or a greater ape. So this is the same shape that a chimpanzee or a gorilla would have. Um, it can be classified as having um, 
a very it's being elongated from front to back and it's more flattened from top to bottom. The mastoid process is uh, very small or absent in pongids. Um, in gorillas, it's very small. It's absent in chimpanzees. You can see that the baby does not have a mastoid process. It's a little M. Uh, you can also there is no M pointing to the baby's skull. Um, and in the Neanderthal, you can see it's quite small. In human adults, it, the shape varies. Um, in females, it can be as small as a Neanderthal's mastoid process, um, but you won't see that same shape, or you won't see that same size in a Neanderthal. <clears throat> so, and then we're going to take a look at another side view of the skull. You can see here they've disconnected the mandible from the skull in this view. You can see that the mandible and the for the newborn and the Neanderthal, while they don't quite have the same shape, have the same general shape. Um, in the newborn, the ramus is angled away from the vertical plane, so you can see that it's pointed back, away towards the back of the skull. And it's very similar to the Neanderthal, it's much further past away from the vertical than it is in the new, uh, the adult modern man where it's very much the same length and for both the Neanderthal and the um, newborn the ramus is actually smaller than the mandible is it's much more pronounced in the newborn but it's quite it's also visible in the Neanderthal um, you can see in Modern man, the ramus and mandible are actually about the same size. Um, so this next picture and the last picture before we're going to take a break and actually continue this in a second part and perhaps a third part is going to be just a figure of the ramus of the mandible. Um, you can see that this um, the coronoid process is quite broad and the mandibular is not just shallow for the uh, newborn and Neanderthal. So where that big deep U shape is on the adult man, it's a much more shallow, gentler curve for the newborn and Neanderthal. And all right, we're gonna continue this in a, another screencast, and we're going to talk about some more similarities, and we're gonna start getting into the physical and uh, study and how they determined that Neanderthal speech is closer to man than, or closer to newborn than it is to man. All right.